Um, so hello everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you are located uh, right now. So it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce you, uh, our distinguished uh, speaker uh, today uh, for uh, IEEE Communication Systems Integration and Modeling Technical Committee is a virtual seminar. So this is the first seminar, uh, first virtual seminar. Uh, of the technical committee, and uh, it's a great honor uh, to have uh, Professor Errol Gelembe uh, here. And um, Professor Gelembe um, is, uh, as you can see, a fellow of, uh, of the IEEE ACM IFIP and a professor uh, in the Institute of Theoretical and Applied Informatics in the Polish Academy of Sciences, and an honorary professor. Um, at the University of Electronic Science and Technology uh, in China, and a researcher you know, uh, at the University uh, Côte d'Azur, uh, Nice, and Sofia uh, Antipoli, uh, France. And um, this is actually a short um, biography, uh, I would say a very short biography uh, of Professor Errol Gelembe. Uh, I have known him actually for uh, for long years, and um, I know actually he's one of the uh, pioneers in the topics that are listed here. So that's why uh, this is a very short uh, biography, um, less than a single line, if I were to <laughs> uh, read the entire bio and achievements. So uh, Professor Gelembe uh, graduated uh, from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara in Turkey, and uh, he is listed in the mathematical uh, genealogy uh, project of uh, American Mathematical Society among the 10 top PhD supervisors in the mathematical sciences. And he is the inventor of the random neural network and the uh, eponymous uh, G networks, the cognitive packet network routing algorithm, the energy packet network algorithm, and uh, the fusion approximations for network performance. And his work won him election to fellowship of the Royal Academy of Science of Belgium, the Science Academies of Hungary, Poland and Turkey, the National Academy of Engineering of France and Academia Europea. And he is active in European research programs. And he received the Mustafa Prize in 2017 uh, before Ur Shahin's uh, same prize uh, that was in 2019 as well as ACM Sigmetrics Lifetime Achievement Award and several other awards. And he was made the Knight of um, the, the Legion of uh, Honor and Commander of Merit by the President of France and the Commander of Merit of the Republic of Italy by the President of Italy. So um, today, um, Professor Gelembe is going to uh, deliver uh, his talk uh, on uh, artificial intelligence for packet networks, the cognitive packet network. Uh, to us. And um, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you here, Professor Gelembe. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and I'll uh, leave the floor to you. Uh, I'm very sure people are uh, excited and eager to uh, hear uh, your exciting talk. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Kantarja. It was very kind of you to introduce me so warmly. Uh, I'll start some slides and uh, present to you a few slides, uh, and then I will present to you some videos. Uh, so uh, let's see now, how are we doing? Um, there we go. My slides should be coming up normally. Okay. And uh, let's see if I'm able to share my screen. Uh, which is the next thing I need to do, right? Uh, yes. There we are. Uh, have I successfully shared my screen? Yes, I have. Um, not yet, uh, but yes, it's coming up now. Yes, exactly. We can up. see now your screen. And mm -hmm. I need to turn back to um, the full slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll be talking to you about, yes, indeed, uh, artificial intelligence and networks. Um, not so much from the, if you wish, data analytics viewpoint, but much more from the viewpoint of, of using AI to control 
broadly speaking, the performance of networks to control their behavior so that you achieve uh, a certain number of goals. Okay, so this is going to be the subject of my talk. Uh, this first slide is a bit of a tourist uh, thing. Um, in the middle, you have uh, the palace. It's a photograph. It's a photograph from Brussels, uh, just the center of Brussels. It's very near the, if any of you have been there, it's very near the old royal palace. And this is the, um, this very large royal palace. And this is the palace of the academies. It's called the palace of the academies. And that's where the Belgian academy meets uh, when there is no COVID. <laughs> okay, so that's our usual meeting place. On the left-hand side is uh, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, uh, the main building where the Hungarian acad academicians meet. And they have, you know, large meeting rooms as well as smaller meeting rooms for people to discuss and so on. And they also have a restaurant and so on. But this is right in the middle of Budapest. And on the right hand side is the palace in which the Polish Academy of Sciences is housed. And uh, the statue in front of it that you can barely see right here is of Copernic, Copernicus, who, um, of course, created big problems for the Catholic Church, for the church in general, for the churches in general, and for religions in general, by indicating that the previous theory concerning the solar system was perhaps wrong. But anyway, so this gives you a bit of an idea of the academies in their different countries. And I felt I needed to share this to you uh, because these academies in Europe actually pay, play an important role more on a day-to-day -day basis and more continuously than say the, the national academies in the US, which are mainly honorary institutions. These academies actually are places where recommendations to governments are made and where uh, there's an exchange between disciplines, a discussion, interdisciplinary discussion about what to do about science and how to invest in it and so on and so forth. And I actively work in these academies. Uh, recently, for instance, I did a report with some colleagues about publications for the Belgian Royal Academy. But so the topic though is of course not about academies, it's, it's about cognitive packet networks. And the purpose of this idea of the cognitive pa packet networks idea, as I said, was not to bring AI in, but how to address the optimization of quality of service, security and energy consumption in the very large quasi infinite systems that our networks have become. As I go into that, I'd like, first of all, to indicate that this is not a short-term project. We haven't been working on this for three years, and now I'm talking about it. Um, I've been talking, working on this, among other things. I must admit, I also publish on other things. But I've been working on this, these ideas for about 20 years. So it goes back to a paper in the Proceedings of the IEEE um, the, from 2001. Um, other uh, kind of milestones are a paper in the communications of the ACM in 2009, um, a paper in the IEEE Journal of Selected Areas of Communications 2016, a paper uh, in 2016 again on, at ICC, you know, the masthead conference of the Communication Society about how these ideas can be integrated into software defined networks. And we did an implementation and a paper from this year, 2020 proceedings of the IEEE again, which describes the current state of our work in this area. And I'd like to acknowledge um, at least some of the people, I mean, I didn't have place to put all the names, but at least some of the people who have worked with me either as PhD students or as postdocs or as coworkers on these topics. And you know, there are people here from Turkey, from Greece, uh, from Iran, um, from France, um, from China, uh, from Nigeria, and so on. So in Poland, so we have you know, a wide variety of people who have worked with me on these topics as PhD students, postdocs, and so on. So uh, let's see a little bit what uh, the issue is and what the questions are. Now, the issues as I see them, okay, are uh, that, you know, we used to, <laughs> you have, most of you haven't known the other days, but we used to work in finite networks. We used to deal with networks which, whose size 
in nodes, pieces of equipment and so on was very clearly fi finite. You know, you take a national te telecommunication network, it might consist of say, uh, without the phones of course, but you know, it would consist of about 10,000, 20,000 pieces of equipment. Okay. I remember for instance, working with a team that was designing the Canadian packet network and their uh, test bed, which crossed the whole of Canada, you know, went from the west coast of Canada to the east coast. And the research project was housed at the University of Waterloo. Eric Manning, who some of you may know from various Canadian institutions, he's uh, still around, I think he's in Alberta. Uh, he was heading this project. I mean, we're talking about small networks. And uh, today things have changed completely. Networks are infinite. I mean, no one can tell you how many nodes there are in, in, in the internet. There are you know, more than anyone can count. And in fact, there is no map of the internet. We know the clusters, we know where traffic comes from and so on, but we don't really know what the topology is. In some countries, it may even be a secret, a state secret, what the exact topology is. So networks have become infinite. They're pervasive, they're everywhere, and they're unknown, okay? Uh, that's, these are, to me, these are facts, uh, that they're pervasive, you will all agree, uh, that they're unknown, I think most of you will agree. I mean, many people are unable to tell you what their university network topology is, simply because it's so large and there is no one actually tracking the topology exactly. And uh, so they're, and basically they're infinite, okay? At the same time, we are never in steady state. Right? We're never working in a steady state situation. Demand is ever growing. Of course, the mobile access has created huge demand. But at the same time now, the internet of things, the IOT, is creating yet another big jump in size. So that's very in interesting. And I think this is, you can quote me on this, but it's my personal view. For me, the internet looks very much like the Roman empire and the barbarians. Okay, the Roman Empire, the barbarians. Now, what was going on? It's very funny, actually, if you think about it. Uh, Rome was very good at building roads. Uh, they would build extremely good roads, pave them. Some of them exist today. I mean, people will say, this is the Roman road number so-and-so that went from here to there. There are, you know, even uh, milestones, milestones, you know, physical milestones. Uh, pieces of stone saying, this is the milestone X from Y to Z along these roads, which still exist today. And Rome was building very good roads. And they, of course, they got better at building them as, it, as they went along. And it cost them a lot of money. But of course, that's how the barbarians then invaded Rome. So <laughs> the barbarians were the ones, you know, coming in from the, all the periphery. As, as the roads got better, uh, they could go in further into the system and kind, kind of disrupt it. So this is a bit like the internet. I mean, we have the Roman Empire. We have you know, better fibers, better this, better this, faster routers and so on. And then the better it is, the more barbarians, but the more users of all sorts we get into the system. And the more things get connected, clearly, the less we know about the network. Now, these are, uh, I guess, more or less the re reality under which, which we live. And at the same time, uh, you know, for at, if it's just been a few years in 2015, I was asked to do a report on the energy consumption of ICT for my, I told you that I work for my national academies on a pro bono basis. We're not paid for the work we do. And I did a report on the use of electrical energy in ICT in general. And of course, ICT for all practical purposes is the internet, you know, all the world of connected computers, of routers, of switches, and so on, and of cloud machines and so on. And uh, basically things haven't changed since 2015. Uh, ICT's use of electrical energy is growing by five to 7% a year. Uh, I stress the term electrical energy. Okay, I didn't say energy uh, because this is a measurement about electrical energy, which is worse than if we were saying energy period. Why is it worse? Because electrical energy is secondary so if you use one unit of electrical energy, very likely you have consumed two units of energy to produce it. Because of the losses associated with the production process, but also with the transportation process of energy. 
Okay, there are line losses. Good old electrical engineers remember that from our undergraduate courses when we did power systems. So uh, at the end of the day, if it's one, it's two, okay? If it's one kilowatt hour of electricity that you use in your router, uh, it's going to be two kilowatts hours somewhere else that's being produced from a primary source, which may be coal, it may be uh, oil, it may be gas, it may be sunlight, um, or it may be nuclear power and so on, or wind power or whatever, okay? Uh, now, uh, the trend, seems to be that we are headed towards 20% of all electricity consumed by 2030 would be electrical energy for ICT, okay? So we have these, if you wish, trends going on. And um, I mean, the number 20% doesn't surprise me at all uh, for a very simple reason. If you look our body, our body, 20% of the energy in the body is consumed by the head. So uh, that the head, you know, the thinking part <laughs> of the technology of society, which is computing and so on, would consume 20% is not at all surprising. I would expect it to go beyond. Now, in all of this happening, uh, what is the good so part of the story? What is something that gives us some hope that we can control or at least understand this process? And that is that, of course, the basic information technology is getting faster and that we are able to automate it, that we, can, we have the hope of being able to automate it through machine learning. Okay? But if we do this, we must have a goal. We must know why we are doing this. I mean, what is the, clearly, what is the metric that we're going to be using to automate it? Okay? What is, the, if you wish, the cost function in the control system? Okay, so these are the things, this is a very broad view and I'm sure some of you will have issue with this and what I've just said, but it's some kind of philosophical view of what's happening in the world of communications. And uh, in this world, uh, we started experimenting a few years ago. So, you know, we worked on this through simulation and modeling for a few years in the early 2000s. And then we started experimenting around 2008, 2009, and we built test beds. So we have, in my talk, I will try to show you a number of experimental results from test beds. I, in this talk, I will never show you a single simulation. Anything I show you in terms of measurements are going to be measurements on real systems. So this is one of our test beds, um, about 50 nodes. Here you have 46, but it's gone up, up, till 100 because you just add boxes and you have, as long as you have racks and space and enough power in a room, you can kind of extend the size of your test bed. So what I'd like to do is show you now some experiments, okay? So now what you're seeing is a video of an experiment, right? On the left-hand side, you have roughly um, the network that I showed you a minute ago on the slide, okay, roughly the same network. And we had picked this topology. Uh, we didn't want it to be huge, so it couldn't be the network, the backbone of the United States, clearly, but it happened to be the backbone of Switzerland, kind of tiny country, right? So we could get the information about the backbone in Switzerland, and we use that as our topology, just to choose a realistic topology. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Professor Gelambe. The experiment is not uh, showing up now. Um, it is uh, your slide view, slide deck. That's what we are seeing now. I understand. So probably uh, I have to turn off the slides. Uh, yes, I believe so. <laughs> sorry. I stop the sharing. Then I start the sharing again. And I turn to this. Can you see it now? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we can, so thank you. What you're seeing is, is exactly the same thing going on, but there are little red crosses. But let me just explain to you what the colors mean. On the left-hand side, you have colors, which are connections, okay? These connections are using paths, but these paths are changing. They're not staying the same. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the quality of service, end-to-end -end quality of service of these same connections. 
and they're color coded in the same way. So if you have a light blue on your left, you have a light blue on, blue on the right, and they correspond to the same connection. Okay, but of course you were noticing that the paths are changing all the time. So above you have delay, below you have jitter. Okay, so you're seeing that, and you can also actually see losses because on the right hand side you will see when paths break. So the connection sometimes breaks and sometimes picks up. Why? Because on the left-hand side, there is a worm attack in progress. And the worm attack is blocking certain links between nodes, okay? At the same time, there's a worm attack, but at the same time, the software in the network at each of the nodes is being patched. So some of the crosses appear, later on they disappear. If they disappear, it's because they've been patched, okay? But at the same time, you also see that the connections, uh, I can show you one that broke. There's a light purple one, okay? The light purple one on top, right here, you see where it picked up again. It broke here and picked up again here, okay? The light purple connection. So you see that there, there were surely some packet losses, okay? So what you're seeing here is really a measurement which is being repeated. So the, 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 the network is running cons constantly as it should. The network is constantly running. Uh, the connections uh, carry video essentially. So we are just because you have to automate the connection somehow and we're just streaming video. And uh, what you're seeing on the right hand side is the quality of service. And what you're seeing on the left hand side is the actual changing topology of the connections okay it's it's not a wireless system it's wired so there are the links are there but they can be blocked by the network attack that's happening so here what this network is doing basically what somehow is doing i haven't said how but somehow it is doing this with using artificial intelligence and machine learning the way it, what it is doing is exactly that it is trying to survive so it's trying to minimize the effect of the attacks that are going on. And it's trying to maintain good quality of service or at least acceptable quality of service as this attack is progressing. And now there was also patching going on, so it's being removed and things are back to normal, okay? So that's, and these are measurements, okay? Now, let me just say a few more things before I go back to my slides. Uh, the first thing is that the algorithm, each of the nodes is actually a Linux box in these experiments. It's a Linux box running an IP substrate. So there's IP at the bottom, but on top of the IP substrate, uh, there is the cognitive packet network protocol. CPN is a protocol that is precisely described in a US patent. Okay, so there, if you look at cognitive packet network, you'll find more than one patent, but you'll certainly find one, um, which I, you know, uh, which I deposited, which is an, a patent that was awarded. As you probably know, the patent award process in the United States is rather long. It typically takes four years. Uh, and uh, the, so there is exactly that algorithm running and it uses random neural networks, a special kind of neural network uh, sitting there. And I'll try to tell you briefly before I go back to my slides, why this particular neural network? Because it provides a unique solution if you give it a given input data, okay? It, it's a recurrent network, so it has feedback in it. Recurrent networks typically can have chaotic cycles and it's extremely difficult to show that their solutions exist and are unique. However, the random neural network has the property that mathematically you can say, if you give it this input, you will always get exactly this output. And uh, so you, all the experiments that you can run with a random neural network are reproducible. Uh, if you give them the same thing, they will do the same thing and give you the same answer, okay? So this is why this random neural network is being used. And uh, there's one random neural network sitting at each of the nodes. And the decision is taken on the one hand by the random neural networks at the nodes, and it's taken on the other hand by the source of the connection. That is by the, if you wish, end user or by the representative of the end user because you can have a, a 
an, a source node which is actually handling a bunch of uh, connections which have different requirements but it's handling all of them okay so decisions are taken at two points uh, at the, not really two points but they're taking at the, all of the nodes of the network and they're taking at all of the entry points of the network okay now let's go back to my slides because i need to um, uh, you know explain these things but i just like to stop for a minute for any quick questions burak can i take mm -hmm. more questions i just um, let the panel uh, the attendees know uh, if they have any questions they can type uh, on the chat screen because uh, they don't have access to their microphones um, so maybe they'll hold the questions uh, till the end or so are, like do we have any questions the, the easiest thing would be to turn on their microphones there may be some quick questions i can take a few and then i'll continue okay let me see i need to move them um, to panel actually uh, so let me see if I can unmute them, I don't think I can unmute them uh, very easily. Uh, let me see. Uh, the question is, there's one question actually, I can uh, quickly uh, share with you. Yeah. Where would the artificial intelligence module be deployed within the network? So As I said, Abdallah, it's, Mubayed, deployed, it's it. deployed at two places. Mm -hmm. It's deployed at all of the nodes. And secondly, it's in, deployed at all of the entry points. Okay, thank you very much. And another question is, uh, do nodes have a global view of the network? Uh, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Neither the, 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 uh, the AI module at the uh, nodes does not have a global view, it just has a local view. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, the uh, decision element at the entry point also only has a local view. See, okay, and um, as Which far allowed, as I, I mean, the, the, the this is this is to allow scalability. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, at this moment, I think I think we don't have. Um, oh, there's another question actually. Uh, what is the yeah. software used for this testbed output to show uh, this delay and jitter uh, and active flows? Uh, what is uh, what software do we use? Uh, I think that is the question. Yes, what software? No, do you it's use? very simple. The uh, the whole uh, the, the, the whole algorithm is based on measurements. Mm -hmm. So every node is collecting measurements. In particular, the entry point has the delay and has the jitter. Okay. So what you're seeing on the right hand side is what is collected by the entry points. They're monitoring their, their connections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Very, and, simple. Very straightforward. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, another question is, what algorithm is used for training? Uh, reinforcement learning. So this is not, this is an online algorithm. It is not like you go off, you have a deep learning algorithm, and then you come back and you put it into the network. This is not that at all. Uh, there is no pre-training. The training is on the job, if you wish. <laughs> okay. Each of the random neural networks at the nodes is learning from its own local experience. Okay, thank you very much. And there's a follow-up question, actually, uh, regarding okay. the software used in the test bed. Uh, as far as I can see, by the way, uh, my apologies. If, if uh, a participant is uh, assigned as an attendee, I need to move them as uh, panelists. I have to figure it out uh, as we continue. Oh, mind, so that's why, mind. yeah, for the moment, I'll just take questions uh, on the chat screen. Um, now, there's a follow-up question regarding the uh, software used uh, here. So uh, do we use scripts loaded in every Linux server? Uh, sorry, do we use what? Uh, scripts loaded in every Linux server? Yes, it's exactly the same script. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, and one last question. Uh, nowadays, we have we are limited by accessing data to process in artificial intelligence algorithms, and especially for network data. And do you use these uh, data to train models, or do we have 
any other choice, what is your opinion uh, about these limitations? Uh, Elif Ak is asking from Istanbul Technical University. Well, there may be a misunderstanding. There is no model here. Uh, what we're running is reinforcement learning and the neural network is acting as the, the neural network in each of the nodes is acting as a so-called adaptive critic. So it stores, the, the, in a certain sense, it stores the success or, or lack of success of certain decisions. And uh, when a new packet has to be forwarded, uh, it is forwarded in the direction of the best success. Okay, this is what reinforcement learning is. Uh, so there is no limit. I mean, all the data is local, is collected locally, and the decision is taken locally by a neural network that acts as the kind of the uh, collector of history. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this neural network, of course, its state is changing. So as the situation of the network changes, it's going to take different decisions because different, it will have observed different success or lack of success. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. But it's best perhaps that I go back now to the slides mm -hmm. uh, so that we can pursue on that line, okay? Yes. Uh, I think I was here. Um, we can't see the slides. I'm going to, I'm going to stop uh, the screen. Yep. Yes. Then I'm going to activate the screen again. Uh -huh. and I'm going to switch to my slides. Okay. And I'm going to share the screen. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll keep conveying to... questions uh, maybe as we uh, proceed. Sure. So maybe you can continue now. Thank you very much. Now, again, uh, just a few words of philosophy. Um, we have uh, users, obviously, in this network. There are the connections. The network is unknown. But they need to uh, re some kind of have develop some kind of situational awareness. Okay, the situational awareness means what's happening around me. It's a bit like a, say, a military unit going into enemy terrain. They have to collect local data, and this is basically what happens. And uh, then what the, what this uh, local decision making is doing? It tries to maximize in its best. It, it does. It cannot. Uh, we're obviously not pursuing a global optimum because we don't know what it is and we don't have the data for that. Everyone has just local data and it tries to maximize its own, uh, the satisfaction of the users that it is trying to manage. Okay, and uh, the satisfaction can include delay, it can include security, it can include, include op operator income if you're dealing with a telephone network. Uh, I mean, you'd be serving the high paying users more than better than low paying users or whatever like that. And you'd be, of course, uh, looking for less energy consumption. Uh, so let me just, I think I will uh, perhaps skip this slide and uh, enter into, if you wish, how we go about it, you know, the engineering of this, okay? Uh, it, this is all based on good old telecoms engineering where we're interested in quality of service. So. I'm in the right community here, uh, TC Sim. We're interested in, in quality of service. However, we need to be a bit broader in our definition of what quality of service is, right? Uh, we can't just say, well, this is going to be delay, packet loss, or jitter, or something like that. I have to be, have take a broader view, and I have to take into account security. I have to take into account issues of energy consumption and so on. And so I need to tell you at the engineering level how these things happen. Uh, let me just skip that as well uh, and get into a bit of formulas. Uh, not too many, but some formulas, okay? Now, I'm going to have a flow, F, okay? Uh, how do I, uh, that's what you saw on the screen. You saw different color codes. These were connections carrying a flow. The connections were, uh, you were from some source to destination and the paths P were changing, right? Now, what do we actually put into this goal function? I use the term goal here, not just because of its, of its meaning in English, but because in reinforcement learning, one uses the term goal uh, with respect to the function we want to minimize or maximize, okay? So we're going to, in this case, minimize a goal, a goal function. 
This goal function will include delay, loss, energy, security. Okay, all of these. Uh, what is delay? It's packet delay, packet loss. Energy consumed by one packet as it travels through the network and security of that packet. Okay, and assuming that I can actually uh, formulate these in some way, uh, this is how I build my goal. Uh, look at the formula that's right here. I guess you can see my pointer. This formula uh, says the goal is as follows. If I don't have any loss, think of L as the packet loss ratio uh, in, in, on a connection, a current value of the packet loss ratio. If I don't have losses, so if I have one minus L, and packet loss ratio can be interpreted as packet loss probability, if you wish. If I don't have losses, then I'm really just interested in delay, energy, and security. And small a, small b, small c are weights. I give them these relative weights. Okay, uh, how would you, I choose them? Well, in some cases, I can map delay into money. For instance, if I have quality of service violations, service level of agreement violations, okay? So if my delay is bigger than something, I won't make any money. So I can introduce, uh, for instance, I would have here an A, which describes how delay is inversely proportionate, if you wish, or proportionate to the amount of money that I'm going to have, okay? And so the lower the delay, the better income I'm going to get from this network and energy of course, is also something that turns into money because we know the, the price of a kilowatt, a kilowatt hour uh, or a watt hour, which is a joule, has a price, okay? It has a price for the network operator, which may be different from the one that you pay at home, but it still has a price. And then you have the third term, S, which is security. Now, if there is no loss, I'm only interested in delay, energy, and security. If I do have a loss, oh well, it doesn't change much because I have to, having a loss means I have to retransmit the packet. If I retransmit the packet, it's going to again incur delay, again incur an energy consumption, and again incur security risks, okay? But it will double up with the amount I've already spent. And I have to consider what happens into the future. So basically what I have is this formula. Um, we can discuss it if you don't understand it fully, but we can discuss it. But this formula would apply, G applies for, as a function of three things. Which node am I sitting at? Which flow am I talking about? And which path am I considering? Okay, because the path is my freedom. If I'm a certain node, from here to the destination, I will typically have a choice of path. I may have several paths, right? So that's what P is. And F is just the flow. It has a source, a destination, a traffic rate, a, perhaps a, uh, a, a type of flow, it can be voice, it can be video, et cetera, and they will have different con considerations and so on. So I end up having this goal function, uh, which I have to determine in terms of which node I'm taking the decision at, which flow I'm dealing with, and which path I will take, okay? Let me go a little bit deeper in a couple of things. Uh, I mean, the, the, because everyone knows what delay is, okay? So you can know that how do you measure delay? Well, you measure it. Uh, for instance, you send out a packet when you get an ACK, you have a, an estimate of a round trip delay, right? So that we all know or you want to find out what the average delay might be, you ping the destination. Now, when you ping it, you don't know which way the ping packet will go, but you get some estimate of the, of the delay. So from any node, so that we know. And loss, we also kind of know quite easily because what do you do? Again, you send out packets and you look back at the flow of acknowledgements. Uh, from that, you can estimate, you can build an estimate of the packet loss ratio, right? So those things we know, but let me talk about security for a few minutes because that sometimes is, is not well understood. Well, I have a goal function for security, which is small s, and then I'll have a large s. Now, small s is a function of a node and a flow. 
why should it be a function of a node in a flow? Because certain flows can ca carry threats for a node. Similarly, certain nodes can be threats for a certain flow. Why? Because if the node is under attack, then the flow will be disrupted. Uh, similarly, if the flow is carrying mischievous, malicious traffic, then it may be a problem for the node M. So we have a relationship, the security thing is a relationship between the node M and the flow F. And how do I transform this into something quantitative? Well, consider I, MF, in security level, which is just suppose you have a, a, an attack detector at a node. You have an attack detector sitting at a node. This attack detector will give you a probability that an attack is going on, okay? And it will never be zero or one because you'll have false alarms. So any attack detector, even the best one, will never give you a zero one answer. It will say it's 5%, it's 10%, it's 50%, etc. okay? So I is exactly the output. You can think of it in practical terms as the output of an attack detector. Okay, of an act, an at, uh, uh, the output of a monitor that is sitting there to figure out whether that node is secure or not. Okay, and what's large T? Well, large T is just my level of tolerance. If I have a very suppose I have a flow that is extremely sensitive to security. Okay, its level of tolerance may be two three percent. If it's just good old voice telephone traffic. Who cares if a few packets are lost here and there by an attack, if there's a denial of service attack, or if, uh, I mean, they can't eavesdrop that easily anyway, so uh, we're not worried. So then T can be 10% or even 20%, okay? So we have I minus T, and what's the little plus that you see? You have brackets and a plus. It means that if I is larger than T, then the cost is being incurred. If I is less than T, then the cost being incurred is zero, okay? Then the quantity small s is zero. So that's interesting. And uh, we have these uh, things. And of course, you notice that right here, I have uh, a typo and this should be the other way around, but okay, you've seen it. And now here, then I can build a path related uh, result concerning because up the small s, was related to one node. The large S is related to all the nodes that come after me. So I'm sitting at node N and the small M is a node that is after me and the following one and the following one and the following one on, my, on this particular path. So I can say the security level is the sum of the small S's. Okay, so the larger this large S, the larger the sum of these small S's, the more unhappy I am about the security of this link. And I may switch and not use this path because it's going to cause trouble. Uh, I can also define it uh, as the max. In some cases you say, I'm not interested in the total, I'm interested in the worst case. So in that case, you may use the max as the way to, you decide about what your security is. So I think I just wanted to show you, and this is exactly actually what we do. It's not, I mean, the example is simple, but this is exactly how we define security. We, in our test bed, we install attack detectors, okay, um, which are monitoring what's going. They're lightweight attack detectors, uh, which are monitoring what's happening. And with their help, we can calculate large I. And for the different flows F, we're going to have different values of the threshold. Some flows are very sensitive. Some flows less, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay. Now. Uh, based on this, uh, let me talk about energy. Energy is, uh, requires power measurement at the routers. Okay? To know what the energy consumed by a packet is, you have to be able to measure the power consumption at each router. And this power consumption at routers is typically a function of total traffic going through the router. So as a function of instantaneous traffic, you have curves and uh, they're kind of, I can show you some, I've uh, worked a lot on this. I've published papers on this issue of power measurement. And what you see typically is that modern routers have like a series of exponential 
uh, curves, you know, saturation, exponential saturation curves. Uh, initially, the, at a low traffic level, uh, a small number of cores are switched on at the router. Then as the traffic goes up, more cores are switched on and so on and so forth. So you have this like a graded thing going on. And uh, so this is the power consumption uh, per, tra per, per uh, total traffic in the router. And this, you can measure total traffic in the router. The router can measure it itself and the router can measure itself its power consumption, okay? So this is information available in the router. It's, this is not the nominal power consumption of the router that you have on the back of a box. It's what is measured in real time, okay? Now, okay, so this is the power consumption of the router, but we were talking about energy. We were talking about energy per packet. What's that? Simple. Energy per packet is power divided by traffic rate, instantaneous traffic rate. Why? Because power is watts per second, traffic rate is packets per second. So if you divide power by traffic rate, you get energy per packet, instantaneous energy per packet. And this is exactly the data that we collect from each of the nodes. And how is it connected? Well, our AI software is sitting at the nodes. So the local information is available to it. Okay, the AI software knows exactly what this quantity is. Okay. And similarly, the AI software is sitting at the nodes. So it can also know the large S values, sorry, the small S values. Okay. So you see that this goal function is constructed directly from local measurements at each of the nodes. And we on all and the delay is from uh, is always calculated round trip to a given point to a given node. So we don't need any common clocks. We're not using common clocks. So what does uh, the algorithm generally do? It calculates the best path from anywhere I am, the best path for me to get to the destination that minimizes this cost function, okay? I've given you like, I think a good 40% to 50% of the story behind, behind uh, what's being done. I know that we're running out of time, but let me move forward a little bit more, okay? Now in the cognitive packet network, Everything is compatible with IP. So any packet going around is an IP packet. Why? Because we didn't want to fight the IP war. So we wanted to, and we just couldn't. I mean, we needed to use the off the shelf equipment. Uh, we're not going to do anything which was not off the shelf. So everything is off the shelf. But we have in uh, the cognitive packet network, we have three types of packets, okay? We have smart packets, we have acknowledgement packets, and we have dumb packets. What are dumb packets? They're payload, payload packets. The smart packets and the ACK packets do not carry any payload, okay? The smart packets are traveling through the network and working with each of the AI software sitting at each of the nodes. And when they reach a node, they say, oh, AI software, uh, I need to get to this particular destination and please tell me what is my next hop. So the AI software from its own history, and I will show you exactly the algorithm in a minute, from its own history, it says, from my recent knowledge, the best hop, the best next hop for you to get to this particular destination right now is this one. Okay, so it advises it on a one hop decision. And then the next, the smart packets moves to the next hop and asks the question again. So the smart packet does this and travels through the network, reaches the destination. When it reaches the destination, it downloads all the data it has collected into the ACK packet. And the ACK packet is sent back along the same path back to the source, okay? And the final decision, the source gets a lot of feedback from all of these smart packets coming back to it, okay? And the, 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 the source packet then does the argmin trick where it's optimizing the path 
but it's going to choose among all the paths about which it has received information. Uh, of course, it will drop, it, it's like an LRU thing, so it will drop uh, the old ones and, 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 and uh, focus on only the recent paths it's heard about. Okay, among the recent paths, it's going to use that. And then the dumb packets are source routed. The dumb packets have an exact path that they will follow based on the instructions that the source node has given them. Okay, so there's, there are two things happening. The smart packets are using the AI everywhere to collect data, and the source node is doing the min operation to get the best of all the data it has received so far to make its own decision. So this is basically how it happens. I could say much more. Uh, uh, let me just uh, show you a little bit. So this is the basic equation for the random neural network. It's, an, it's at a node. Um, uh, this is a, uh, it's a kind of a neural network that I had invented, uh, which is uh, a rigorously mathematically defined and so on. It uh, was first published in the journal Neural Computation in 89. There were papers 89, 90, and then in the transactions on neural networks in 98 and so on. There's a whole series of papers about this. You can find me from you can find them from my Google Scholar page, uh, and the um, reinforcement learning um, algorithm is as follows. Okay, we have the goal function here. I haven't put security, but you know it's part of the picture. Uh, then we use the smart packets to uh, to uh, uh, search for uh, decisions for the uh, smart uh, for the smart uh, for the smart packets. They are getting routed using uh, these uh, no intermediate nodes, using reinforcement learning. And uh, the um, random neural network at a node is a fully recurrent network, where each neuron in the network is the representative, is the champion. Each of these neurons is the champion for one particular output link, OK? So you have a champion for each of the output links. Of course, you're not going to choose a champion for going back the way you came for the smart packet. The smart packet is going to go forward. It's not going to go back. So uh, these, these nodes, and it's a competitive activation network with weights, with excitatory and inhibitory weights. And here is how the details of the reinforcement learning algorithm works. First of all, I told you about the adaptive critic. The adaptive critic is the neural network. Uh, we have a threshold T, which tells you it's the threshold is the historical value, the short-term history, it's about like over the last 20, 30 packets, a short history of what's happened, uh, what was the resulting value of the goal function, or rather what was the resulting value of the reward function. Reward is one over goal, the inverse. So you are uh, minimizing the goal and you are maximizing the reward. So you look at the reward. So T is the historical value of the reward. Uh, if uh, the most recent uh, uh, information you get from the X coming back tell you that, that your decision, uh, recent decision is bad, because why would it be bad? Because the reward that you've obtained is uh, worse. I mean, in, in the first one that I have there is where it's better, but let me start with the worse. If it's worse, then what you say, well, this one should be weakened. This decision should be weakened, so you reduce the weights associated with that, uh, with, with the weights pointing to that neuron, and you reduce the weights, uh, and uh, you reduce the, uh, you increase the inhi inhibitory weights, and you give everyone else a greater chance. And if, on the other hand, the previous result was good, R sub L is larger than TL, mi TL minus, my most recent returning reward is better, than or better than or equal to uh, the uh, historical value, then what I do is I strengthen the decision that was just taken. So this is happening all the time as ACK packets come back to the node, you update the weights based on the results that you have observed, okay? There's also a renormalization step. And let's look at some measurements. Uh, let me show you this one. Uh, so uh, this is a typical measurement. Uh, you are, uh, in this experiment, what we did was we had we had set up our test bed and then once in a while we create saturation at uh, one of the links so we're saturating a link 
so uh, what what happens then is that the delay up to then i mean the algorithm was running we were using a good path and then the, the, the delay just jumps up because you've saturated that link and you you jump up in in delay measurements you have a lot of losses you have quite a few packet losses but then because the end user sees that this particular path is not good anymore and because it has a list of paths that were brought back by the smart packets it choose, chooses the next best it chooses the next best which is generally pretty good compared to the previous one it's probably as good and you go back down to a low delay a few milliseconds round trip delay and then you have you may have things like that happening again because we're creating problems for the network we're, we're kind of seeing whether it is robust so we're creating saturation at certain links and here you're seeing that the algorithm is recovering from these effects and allowing the system on average to work well uh, let me show you another curve which is kind of interesting here you have uh, on the x-axis you have percentage of smart packets that you have added onto the traffic so how do we generate the source launches smart packets generates smart packets as a percentage of its ongoing traffic. So it's not like everything is done before by the smart packets and then nothing happens. The smart packets are running all the time and enforcement learning algorithm is running all the time, so on and so forth. Now, what you see here is that as you increase the percentage of smart packets, the end-to-end -end delay gets better, as you would expect. There's more intelligence, okay? It's getting better. Uh, you don't see the if you wish the overhead effect simply because the smart packets are much shorter we're using a payload which is full ethernet packets basically in this uh, test bed so the the normal packets are very large uh, the 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 smart packets are about 10 percent of the size uh, between 100 and 200 bytes they're much shorter and uh, so they're not really overloading the system and as you add more smart packets to which it works better but clearly there's a point of diminishing returns when you have 20 to 30 percent smart packet quote unquote overhead uh, you shouldn't go any further because you've gotten most of the gain that you would expect from the system okay so uh, and what you see here is that the dumb packets have it have it really good that's the line at the bottom the smart packets get a worse deal why because they're also making mistakes so they are sometimes, the advice they, they get is sometimes not that great. So they pursue, but they bring back to the source multiple paths. So the source then optimizes, you know, it's a double optimization. You first optimize for the smart packets, and then at the source, you optimize for the dump packets. And that's why you have this net difference between the delay observed by the smart packets and the delay observed by the dump packets. Now, what I try to do is go, you'll see a lot of curves and a lot of measurements here because we have had done a lot of experiments with very different topologies and different things. And, um, and uh, oh, this is, this is the kind of curve which is typical of power consumption in routers. Okay, I told you that went kind of had two humps. There was the initial part and the second part and the third part and the fourth part in some cases. It depends on how the hardware in the router is turned on as the load increases. Okay, but these are typical curves that you see. Another one. They're all different machines, obviously. But we did a lot of that and we use them. Well, this is another one that you're seeing up there. This is yet another router where you see three humps, three switch ons of, of, uh, of equipment in the router as the load increases. So we did wireless, we implemented the system for wireless. I just like to show you a few curves. Okay. A few results. Okay. One thing we did, I mean, I, I, the first video I showed you was where we were running this on a flat test bed with every node is running the algorithm. Okay. Now here we, we did an overlay. We implemented a simplified overlay uh over the internet itself just software on the internet and we gave uh, we simplified it in several ways one simplification was for instance that decisions aren't taken everywhere they're just taken at the overlay nodes okay between the overlay nodes we just have standard ip 
and we don't know what the topology is. We're just sitting at the overlay nodes. And uh, at these overlays, we also limited the choices. We gave every node not the choice of sending through any of the neighbors, uh, because any of the neighbors would be any IP address, actually, in this context. We just said, we will give you four choices. In each case, we gave four choices related to geographic proximity. Okay, So this is the thing. And what we were seeing here is substantial savings in uh, latency using this algorithm, even though the algorithm is considerably simplified compared to IP. And we were running experiments, uh, Melbourne, Gibraltar, Narita, Santiago, Mosca, Dublin, etc. This is our Journal of Selected Areas of Communications paper, 2016. You can find all these results in there. So this is for delay. And we also ran for, uh, this is kind of what is happening uh, on successive days because we ran this for a whole week. Well, at least a whole working week, five days. And you can see all the measurements in round trip delay uh, for uh, the IP blue and for the, the uh, CPN red. Okay, so you have an impressive kind of difference. Of course, down here is 250, below is 250, and up here is around 400. But still, you know, you have a substantial difference. And you see this happening. Um, uh, the other thing we did was to look at how much throughput uh, we could we could uh, gain, okay? I, and looking, you know, how much uh, traffic we could pump through these connections and through on throughput as well, we were getting significant gains. Uh, on the left hand side, you see again uh, the um, overlay. In this case, is blue, and the uh, and the IP route is is the red one. Uh, so um, other, you know, so this is another implementation. Uh, currently, we've done an implementation with uh, uh, with SDN. So we have an SDN contro con controller. We have, and this is an IoT application, SDN controller, and a uh, then just switches or you know uh, low end routers, and then IoT devices and. Here, the focus is on security, but we measured delay, we measured all kinds of things. And what you're seeing on the curve up there, you remember I showed you T sub L, the quantity T sub L, which was the historical behavior and how it was changing. So uh, this, is the, 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 this is the variation around the historical level and we see ups and downs. And here we're seeing uh, the reaction time changes. Now, because we use SDN in this case, the reaction is much slower. So you're seeing values of 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, uh, because the SDN controller does not react instantaneously. It reacts periodically to update the paths. While in the base example that you saw in my initial video, uh, changes could happen anytime based on the router's decisions. In this case, the SDN controller only does it periodically typically every 100 or 200 or 300 milliseconds. So we have like much longer reaction times to, to, the, to changes in the system. So anyway, I just could go on. Uh, I think I have about 100 slides, but I'm certainly not going to go all over them. Uh, we have, a, for instance, a paper in the Transactions on Cloud Computing 2018, where we apply similar concepts to choosing a cloud server and choosing a server within the cloud, or if you, if you wish, a virtual machine within the cloud, using similar concepts, similar techniques, again, based on random neural networks and reinforcement learning, so that you get, if you wish, the best uh, quality of service. In this case, it's a matter of getting good delay and not violating the SLA agreements, okay? Well, I think I'll stop there because I'm already about 10 minutes or so past my time, uh, but and there are perhaps some good questions that people would like to ask. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gelambe. This was um, really an exciting and uh, a fascinating talk, very inspiring talk. Um, we really appreciate.